Welcome all to another The History Of video. In this one, we're going to be looking at the US's assault jackets used during the D-Day landings in 1944. If you haven't already, take a look at our video on the British battle jerk and as it directly helped the creation of these vests. So let's begin. Much like the British battle jerk and seeing being used by British and Canadian forces on the beaches of Normandy, the U.S. assault jacket, also referred to as the invasion or assault vest, Normandy assault vest, D-Day vest, or Ranger vest, was a limited issued item used only by select forces. However, what makes it stand apart was its launch into popularity because of the 1998 movie Saving Private Ryan. It was here that for the first time the vest was largely seen by the public, and because of that it, along with various other items, became more valuable as the collector's value skyrocketed. However, it leads many to wonder what were these vests and why were they seen only during D-Day and onwards? Well, to fully understand that, let's jump back a bit. As we mentioned in the first part, in 1942 a British Ordnance Officer Colonel E.R. Rivers McPherson unveiled his design for the battle jerkin, his answer to the 1937 webbing equipment that was standard issue to British and most other Commonwealth forces at that time. He believed that the webbing hadn't really been updated over the last few hundred years and served little purpose on the modern day battlefield. After testing, a little over 20,000 jerkins were developed between the UK and Canada and were seen mainly being used by special forces and many units involved in beach landings, D-Day being the most famous instance. Of those 20,000 plus jerkins, one made it into the hands of US Colonel Wayne Allen, who brought it back with him to the United States to determine whether the idea behind it was sound. The response to the concept was good, but US officials wanted to base their ultimate verdict on whether the British fully intended to adopt the jerkins and phase out the 37 webbing, as doing so would ultimately prove the idea of a single piece of gear was a better one. When the British decided against adopting it as standard issue, the US essentially shelved their idea for a vest. That was until 1943. With American and British leaders continuously attempting to plan some form of invasion of Europe, the realization that a large majority of troops would get there by boat, as well as likely having to fight their way through the Atlantic Wall, resulted in the idea of a single vest resurfacing. After failing to realize that many US forces arriving in England did not have the necessary training to take part in an amphibious landing, the ATC, or Assault Training Center, was hastily assembled and began teaching them in preparation for the future operation. It was here the idea of an assault vest was resurrected, with officials believing that a properly developed one would benefit troops who may find themselves in deep water and sand, as it would help lighten the load and would be easier to take off in a hurry in the event they needed to abandon equipment. This idea also partially came to be because of the state of the US military's current web equipment. Much like British forces, the US had played around with different webbing pieces and equipment since World War I, but instead of a recently updated universal system like the 1937, it was more or less a hodgepodge of newer and older pieces. For the most part though, the suspension system worked. The main issue arose from the haversacks. Going into the war, the US was still using the M1910 and M1928 haversacks. Both were compatible with the webbing system of the time, with the main difference between the two being small, namely updated and repositioned buckles and pouches. However, the issue both versions faced was that they simply weren't made for newer forms of combat seen during World War II. They were optimal for a specific set of items, most of which were tethered to World War I and the interwar period. And with newer weapons, equipment, and gear being issued, officials saw that certain forces would suffer because of this. One such force, soldiers involved in amphibious operations. And so, in early 1943, the ATC got to work designing a newer version of the assault jacket. The first prototype was developed with British materials such as securing straps and buckles. Now these early prototypes are a bit of a contested topic among collectors and historians, as many believe that only a small number, around two to three, were made for early tests and trials. Alternatively, there are those who believe that the supposed figure is a bit higher. Either way, what is known is that there were at least two made as they were both recorded being worn by a flamethrower crew who were a part of a series of tests in February 1944 to determine if the vests could be used by other types of units. In addition, a number of alleged prototypes that have surfaced over the years have all been deemed as fakes or reproductions, with the originals likely lost to time. After a bit of trial and error, the completed version was seen sometime between September 1943 and early 1944, with it scheduled to make its way to mass production and distribution. However, there were a few unforeseen challenges that needed to be overcome first. 
On April 5th, 12,000 vests were requested for the 1st Army, as this was enough to nearly fully equip the men in the assault regiments and leave a little extra left over to be distributed as seemed fit. With the requisition request put in, it was soon realized that the British lacked the means to mass-produce the vests in time for the operation, and so the prototype was airmailed back to the U.S. in the hopes factories could fill the quota. Arriving on the 17th of May, a handful of factories got to work, and over the next week or so, the entire quota of vests, close to 14,000, were made and shipped back to England, where they began to arrive on the 23rd and distributed starting on the 26th. So let's actually take a look at the vest and its layout. Right off the bat, these were made of a cotton duck cloth material and came in a darker olive drab color, number seven, the more commonly seen one, and the lighter olive drab number three. The use of the two colors came down to what was available to the manufacturers rather than a field purpose, such as use in various terrains. Because of the different producers, variances were seen in the shading of the olive drab three and seven, as well as edging colors. They were primarily made in three sizes, small, medium, and large, although a few examples of extra large have also been seen. Starting at the top were two quick release straps, one on either shoulder. Though the reasoning behind these is still not fully known, many believe it was a general purpose strap to secure any type of equipment or gear, from the N7 gas mask bags, rifles and binoculars, to gas brassards, an item used to detect chemical weapons by changing color, which were issued to all assault troops participating in Operation Neptune. Below, along the front, were two quick release straps, one at chest level and one right below the waist. Right above the lower strap was a reinforced section which featured a series of grommets, two pairs on the front and two on the back, with each pair featuring an opening below it. These were likely to hook additional equipment onto, specifically ones that featured the hook attachment method seen on many pieces since the M1910 system. The hooks would be slotted through the grommets with the actual hanging section coming out of the opening below them. The problem was the spacing between the grommets and the opening were a little too far apart to actually properly accommodate accommodate hanging the pouches and other pieces. So soldiers had to get a little creative with attaching items, usually in the form of cutting the opening a little higher or just jerry-rigging pieces to hang however possible. On the front were four general purpose pouches, two inwardly angled ones on the chest with the other two below the waist. These were general purpose pockets intended for magazines, stripper clips, ammo, and more essential combat items. Next to the two lower pouches were two smaller ones, which featured a 16-inch long strap intended to secure the standard Mark II fragmentation, the M18 smoke or M15 white phosphorus grenades. On the back, two additional pouches were seen, a deeper one towards the upper back and one shorter one seen towards the bottom. These were meant to store secondary items such as rations, toiletries, and personal items. The top saw the addition of a flap with two eyelets above it with a securing strap towards the bottom which was used to attach and secure an entrenching tool. It also had a small sleeve on the wearer's left hand side to secure a bayonet or combat knife. The lower pouch featured two small securing straps which could be used to either expand or compress the section depending on what was being stored inside it. Finally, right above the reinforced grommet area were three half oval shaped openings which were for venting. Now, all this hectic last minute chaos is often identified as a reason for the design error associated with the grommets. With the constant shifting of the vest to different manufacturers, it has been assumed the measurements were not double checked before submitting the final design for mass production. In addition, many soldiers stated that when they received the vest, they were not formally instructed on where to pack certain items. And so, soldiers pretty much improvised and put what they thought would be essential in the front and non-essential in the back. Come June 6, the vests made their way to members of the 16th Infantry Regiment of the 1st Infantry Division, the 8th Infantry Regiment of the 4th, and 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th, as well as members of the 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions. However, photos also show that they made their way into the hands of others, such as cameramen and embedded correspondents. Once again, we must ask the question, how well did these work, and why were they really only seen during D-Day and the days afterwards? Well, unlike the British Battle Jerkin, these were designed specifically for the first waves participating in the Normandy invasion. Although they were made with that in mind, they were overall received fairly poorly. Many found them to be uncomfortable in that they were too heavy and hot, as well as awkward, as they were too long for many wearers. One solution some troops did was simply cut them down to about waist length and sometimes even higher to help with lightening the load as well as helping with movement. However, issues with the vest weren't always a minor inconvenience but rather a fatal one as soldiers who found themselves in deep water would often have to quickly ditch them or face sinking and inevitably drowning. 
The most prevalent cause of this was because despite being fitted with quick release straps, they often did not work as intended as they, along with other webbing on the jacket, would swell once exposed to water. In addition, many soldiers who made it ashore found that because the vests were too long and with items in the lower front pockets, they found it nearly impossible to move to a prone position, resulting in them becoming more susceptible to enemy fire. However, even with these issues, a number of vests made their way inland, but as the days progressed, many were abandoned, traded, or replaced for standard webbing, with only a handful continuing to be used afterwards. One of the last spotted uses of the vest was with members of the 1st Infantry Division in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge, which lasted from December 1944 to January 1945. Now, these vests didn't quite just fade into obscurity after D-Day, however. No, in fact, there were two more endeavors which were undertaken by the U.S. military, one involving a failed follow-up order by the Army and a second involving the Marine Corps. In mid-July, a request was sent for an additional 10,000 vests to be made for use by new units. However, being that these vests weren't considered standard issue, as well as the fact that duck cloth was in high demand, the request was put on hold. A reply came through shortly after by the Quartermaster General of the European Theater of Operations, Major General Littlejohn, stating, I question whether or not these jackets will be of any value other than a war souvenir. After that point, there was little mention about the vests save for a few research and development documents evaluating them from mid-September, which states the number of issues the vests had according to soldiers who wore them. These reports recommended shortening the vests so that they did not move past the waist, as the analysts believed the length, not the material, was to blame for the lack of mobility, as well as moving the lower front pouches up closer towards the chest and removing the lower back section entirely. However, these recommendations likely never saw anything come from them as no further vests were made. Finally, in December of 1944, the Marine Corps got their hands on two sets to study the viability of using them for first wave beach landing operations as these were more frequent in the Pacific Theater. They took the idea a step further and assessed whether these could replace their packs, cartridge belts, and suspenders entirely. The results? Pretty much the same across the board. They were too hot, constricting, uncomfortable, had poor weight distribution, and they even said they believed the pockets were more fitted for British magazines and ammunition than US ones. So what happened to the vests after the war? Well, the ones used by landing forces were mostly grabbed up by returning soldiers, as well as many French citizens who found them scattered across the country and were held on to as mementos and keepsakes. However, there were some examples, such as this one, of a French soldier in Vietnam during the first Indochina War using them. This likely came to be by way of leftover unissued vests being given to France along with various other equipment and gear after the war, which then made its way over to Southeast Asia. Since then, quite a number of them in both great and clearly used conditions have been seen on the collector's market. Today, they are quite sought after, fetching anywhere from three to 5,000 US dollars or even more. In addition, because of its increase in popularity, because of Saving Private Ryan, many commercial reproductions of various quality have also been seen. Much like the British battle jerk and the assault vests have been hotly debated as whether they were ahead of their time or just a one-off limited use piece. Though they can be considered more of a failure than their British counterparts, many point to it as inspiration for more modern day military equipment. A special thanks to Joshua Kerner, a member of the Men of the Century, a group dedicated to reenacting, preserving, and researching the 100th Infantry Division, who reached out to us and provided a wealth of information, records, and documents. The link to their website can be found in the description below. And with that, we've come to the end of another two-parter. Hopefully this video was entertaining and educational. Remember to tap that subscribe button and make sure the notification bell is active, or just check back soon for more of the history of, right here on Uniform History. 